For Miller himself, success meant that Hollywood came calling. To most writers and performers, it had an irresistible lure, rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous, the Hollywood aristocracy. There was a party each evening. The company would sit around after dinner or wander out to the pool for more intimate conversation. In this room full of actresses and wives of substantial men, all striving to dress and behave with emphatically ladylike reserve, Marilyn Monroe seemed almost ludicrously provocative. A strange bird in the Avery. The eye sought in vain to find the least fault in the architecture of her form as she danced. It was a perfection that aroused a wish to defend it. Though I suspected at the same time how tough she must have been to have survived here for so long. The, the very uh, inappropriateness of our, our being together was to me the sign that it was appropriate, that we were, we were two parts, however remote, of this society, of this life. One was sensuous and life-loving, it seemed, while in the center of it there was a darkness and a tragedy that I didn't know the dimensions of at that time. Uh, and the same thing was true of me. So it wasn't that crazy. And yet, and then at a certain point, you decided, well, you, you fell in love, basically. Yes. After that first meeting, though, your first impulse, I think, was to escape, to resist. Uh, you write, you've written in the book, flying homeward, her scent still on my hands, I knew my innocence was technical merely, and the fact blackened my heart. But along with it came the certainty that I could, after all, lose myself in sensuality. In other words, you'd fallen head over heels in love, and... Uh... That's right. But at the beginning, why do you think she needed you? What drew her to you, do you think? First of all, I took her at her own evaluation, which uh, very few people did. I, I thought she was a very serious girl way back, uh, and uh, that she was struggling, I thought, because she generally was thought of as being a rather lightheaded, if not silly, human being. Uh, that's because I loved her, so I took that attitude toward her, and uh, so the best of her she thought was in my eye. Therefore, the hope she had was with me. The affair turned Miller into an A-list celebrity. It was Hollywood's strangest coupling, the world's most glamorous screen icon with one of America's foremost left-wing thinkers. Miller's own relationship with the movie business had been compromised from the start. The studio bosses were deeply wary of his politics. In 1951, Columbia Pictures bought the screen rights to Death of a Salesman. Then, against Miller's wishes, they excised passages which suggested disenchantment with American society, reducing the character of Willie Loman to a psychotic... Had he not, had he refused to name names, he would no longer make a film in Hollywood. <laughs> London Airport. Down in the passenger list as Mr. and Mrs. Miller, a honeymoon couple arrive in Britain to face the biggest headlines since Caxton set up in business. Yes, it's Marilyn Monroe arriving with her playwright husband, Arthur Miller. Flash bulbs were popping from every angle, but Marilyn had nothing to say for the microphone. They married in 1956. The headlines said, Egghead marries Hourglass. And their honeymoon in London coincided with Monroe shooting The Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence Olivier. But Miller wasn't supposed to have gone on honeymoon, nor even to have left America, for by now he too had been subpoenaed by Joe McCarthy to be examined before the Committee for Un-American Activities. One was struck time after time by the unreality of it all. That is, the, the committee was acting, as in my case, for example, Congressman Walter of Pennsylvania, uh, let it be known to my lawyer the day before I was to go before the committee that if uh, I would permit uh, him to take a photograph with uh, Marilyn Monroe, he would call off the hearing. 
Now, uh, of course, I didn't agree to that, but the point of it was that this wasn't... At the time, it didn't even shock me. Well, I refused, and when I refused, he comes in the next morning and pretends that I am an imminent danger to the whole republic. Miller's subpoena sent shockwaves through the movie industry. If Marilyn Monroe's husband were proven to be an enemy of the state, it could be very bad for business. Marilyn's studio boss was the autocratic and rabidly anti-communist Spiros Skouras. That all of the dreams that you good people he certainly tried to intimidate you, Spiros Skouros, didn't he? Well, when my turn came, <laughs> it was, I forgot now, some years later, and uh, he came to see me, and he was the head of 20th Century Fox, and he said, uh, Arthur, I hope you're going to be a good fellow and you're going to do what's right. And, of course, he was only interested in me because I was married to Marilyn, who was their biggest star. When Miller finally appeared before the committee himself, he admitted to his own past left-wing activities, but he refused to provide a list of colleagues who might also have been involved. He wouldn't name names. I met him again after I refused to testify, and he said, You are Socrates! It, these guys, uh, there was no principle involved uh, ever anywhere that I could detect. It was simply that they were getting very bad pressure from a powerful group in the government. Uh, their publicity was dreadful, and uh, they wanted to get, get out from under it. Mr. Miller, you were sentenced today. Well, it seemed to me a rather light sentence. How do you feel about it? Well, it is a light sentence, but I don't happen to be guilty, so I'm going to appeal it. Mr. Miller, you were charged with contempt because you wouldn't talk about your friends. How do you feel about it now? I feel the same as I ever did, which is that I don't believe that a man has to become an informer in order to practice his profession freely in the United States. Marilyn Monroe was by now the biggest female star in the world. Acting as her consort, was becoming a full-time job. For a while, Miller stopped writing to look after Marilyn and her emotional needs, but he was increasingly uncomfortable in the goldfish bowl of publicity. And now, Marilyn's state of mind and health were deteriorating. She'd had a series of miscarriages, and she was relying more and more on barbiturates to calm her demons. But she worked on. Movies like Some Like It Hot continued the Monroe legend, while Marilyn herself was falling apart. Can you describe what you refer to as the inevitability of her tragedy? Why did she have to struggle, do you think, in the way that she did? Uh, basically, her struggle was a psychological struggle against uh, abandonment, against abuse. In our terms today, she would have been thought of as an abused child. Uh, now, the psychological damage that that creates is very well known. And uh, she struggled in a lifetime and lost against that damage. That's fundamentally what, what it was. Uh, her mother condemned her. Her mother was uh, uh, mentally ill and uh, tried to destroy her at one point. And, uh, she, it was also a question of a surrounding uh, uh, fundamentalist religion which condemned exactly what she was doing, namely acting, being in show business. Uh, so that there was a stain of uh, the illicit and the condemnation always there at the same time. She was in rebellion when she acted and she expected punishment as a result of it somewhere in that psyche. Uh, it's, there's a number of forces that were working for it, but many, some of them were particular to her, but uh, it's by no means an unheard of type.